Hello everyone, it's Steph from Stellium Astrology. You're listening to episode 39 of the Stellium Astrology podcast. And today I actually very uh, unusually have the place to myself. So I'm recording with the door open in the hope that the cats won't scratch at the door. But so far they're running around like absolute nutters. Um, I'm hearing, which one's that archer most likely? He's just jumped up on the windowsill. Um, so yeah, they're going to be wreaking havoc, I can imagine, but it's better than having a closed door because they can't cope with a closed door for some reason. Um, anyway, I'm Steph. Um, if you've just tuned in for the first time, I'm Steph, uh, Stephanie James, and I am your hostess and I'm the founder of stelliumastrology.com and also the host of this podcast. And I do classes for the London School of Astrology. Most recently I've done a class for them on Lilith and I will be doing some more classes on Lilith in May um, for a branch of the London School of Astrology in China and I've done a few other classes with the LSA in person and also on their online curriculum and uh, I also used to write horoscopes for Elle magazine as well as a a number of other publications so um, if there's somebody who will sit down and give me the opportunity to open my mouth and speak my mind often what falls out is astrological uh, insight and uh, jargon <coughs> so good job I have a podcast and the reason why I'm going through this learning series with you guys is so that I can just talk in astrology language and hope that you guys are following <laughs> I hope that you guys are enjoying anyway because I've been enjoying recording these shows for you and um, today we're going to continue um, with our our tour around the houses but before we do I just wanted to say thank you to Annie M who left a review on Podbean um, and it says here, Annie says, I've been enjoying this series on astrology. It's been most useful in refreshing my memory. Thank you, Annie. You're welcome, Annie. It's my pleasure. Uh, like I said, I really enjoy it and I'm glad that you're enjoying refreshing your memory. The interesting thing about this podcast is it's attracting people from all kind of experiential backgrounds. So some people are completely new to astrology Um, And then I've got people who kind of know a bit about astrology, but not that much. Then you've got people who have been doing astrology for years. um, And I've even got people listening who have um, clients who actually have people coming to them for readings as well. So it's a really nice, broad spectrum of listeners. And it kind of keeps me on my toes (laughs) because I know that there's probably people out there listening who have expertise in areas that I don't have. And, um, you know, I know that there are also people out there who are listening who don't have the experience that I do and haven't got the ability to articulate what they're trying to say with the chart sometimes and sometimes aren't completely au fait with the language that I'm using. So I have to try and remember to keep it relatively jargon free, which can be hard. Um, But, you know, like I said, it keeps me on my toes. So like I said, we're, we're doing a tour around the houses So far, we've done one and seven and two and eight. And I decided to do the houses like this because it's kind of, I don't know, it's not a cop out. It's it it sort of saves time a little bit. Um, But actually, the houses are, they are a kind of polarity. They kind of, in the same way you've got signs and they're opposite. You've got houses with their polarity, um, the, the, the kind of opposite seesaw kind of effect of how the houses work. Now, um, it's it's an interesting astrology works in such a an interesting and unusual way. Um, you know, it's it's fun to explore these things in a way that hopefully familiarizes you with these kind of strange polarities, divisions, ways of looking at the chart. So um, we're moving on to houses three and nine today, and houses three and nine are quite. Um, they're the Gemini and Sagittarius houses. They have that feel about them. Now, um, I mentioned in a previous episode that I had found a book that, I mean, there's lots of ways that these the houses have been described, but I like, I just like the way it's written in this book, which is called Midlife is Not a Crisis. Um, and it says here, just briefly, I'm just plucking some bits out here. Um, The planets in astrology are the verb, the action. Without the planets, there would be no astrology. Think of them as the actors in a play. They move the story along. The word planet comes from the Greek and means wanderer. So um, that's nice. I thought that was quite a nice explanation. And then it goes on to the signs to say, "If if each planet is an actor in the play, then the signs are how the actors express themselves. 
Signs demonstrate soft styles of behaviour. The moon is always the moon, our heart, our feelings and intuition, but it behaves differently in tender cancer than it does in feisty Aries. <laughs> um, okay, Archer. Such a drama queen, that cat. Um, and then here we go to the houses. The houses are the 12 slices of pie in the circle that represents the chart. Six below the horizon and six above. They tell us where the action takes place. If the planets are the actors and the signs are how the actors express themselves, then the houses represent the stage or the arena on which the action unfolds. Each house describes a different area of your life. Now, this, this, this little summary was, I think, the bit that I quite liked. The family, a family of symbols. There is a planet, sign and house that are all related. They belong to the same family. They are not interchangeable, but they are connected. For instance, the seventh house is the natural home of Libra, the seventh sign. And Libra is ruled by the planet Venus. All three are associated with love, beauty, values and committed relationships. The sign Cancer, the fourth sign, is associated with the fourth house and the moon. All three relate to, fo to home, family and nurturing. So um, they're related. The houses are related to the planets and signs. Um, so we've already been through the signs of the zodiac. We've already gone through the planets. They're all connected. But you can have a different sign on the cusp of the seventh house, for example. Um, and it would give that that area a different feel but in that area of life so if you had um, Capricorn on the cusp of your seventh house instead of Libra um, you know you, you might be attracting people who are um, quite traditional with re their relationship values you know Capricorn being a traditional sign or um, you know maybe a little bit old-fashioned maybe you attract older people um, successful business-minded people perhaps people that are um, able to take on a lot of responsibility in order to provide for, you know, the, the future of the relationship, for example. Um, whereas if you maybe had, um, I don't know, um, just off the top of my head, Gemini on the seventh house cusp, um, maybe you would attract somebody who um, may be an indecisive person. It might be that there's always a choice for you in relationships. You might always not that I'm saying that you definitely always have two people on your mind, but there's always that option when there's Gemini. There's always a decision or a choice to be made. Um, but the people that you attract may be more, um, uh, maybe teachers or people working in schools or working with young people um, that like to communicate and talk a lot. Um, you know, there's a different feel between each of the signs. And when those signs sit on the cusp of any house, they take on the flavor of that house but they they sort of season it with their own style as such so hopefully that kind of makes sense um and yes when the when the planets appear in each house they kind of are the people that are involved in that area of your life so um you've got natal placements of planets in houses and you've also got transiting placements of planets in houses um so yeah that's a bit of a a waffle <laughs> a little bit of a waffle but hopefully it made sense now um to, to get started on um our our third and ninth house um i've got a little uh quote that i found that i thought was quite a, a good one i'm a writer of books in retrospect i talk in order to understand i teach in order to learn and the reason why that quote that's a, a quote by robert frost the reason why that quote works for me as far as a third and ninth house polarity is concerned is that to start with the Gemini third house kind of essence of the third house, which is, you know, it's a, a lot about communication, usually about paperwork um, and sort of dealing with um, sharing ideas and networking. Uh, you know, writing books would probably come into the third and ninth house polarity quite highly likely actually um, and talking to understand talking in order to understand is very Gemini um, I know that myself being a Gemini ascendant I do sometimes have to have a conversation because just having the conversation helps me to make sense of something whereas some people can just have that internal monologue and they can figure stuff out in their head 
sometimes for me it's about voicing what I have to say and even hearing it coming out of my own mouth helps me to make sense of what I'm actually thinking um, and you know teaching in order to learn is another quite Sagittarian thing because when you become a teacher of a subject it doesn't mean that you know everything about that subject unless of course you really have studied um, you know been tested extensively and even then you can't know everything about everything a lot of teachers that I speak to say I don't know everything but what I don't know I research and I learn about and then if I get those questions come up again then I can go on and teach that with more knowledge behind me so there's a there is a student and teacher axis about the third and ninth house in the same way that you've got with Gemini and Sagittarius um, there's a kind of student teacher essence um, and it's the kind of environments where you do have learning and um, uh, teaching in many ways. So um, let me find my, um, there we go, there's my notes. So with the third and the ninth house being about gathering and spreading information, if we think about the principle of Gemini who like to learn and label everything and understand what everything is, there's it's not the same as Virgo, which is quite discerning and likes to understand, you know, um, whether or not it's useful to it. Gemini is all about collecting information. It's kind of like an information hoarder. Um, and on the other side of that, the flip side of that, the ninth house. So from the third house of collecting all the information, writing about it, uh, we go to the ninth house, which is all about sharing information. So actually, these two houses are about communicating and broadcasting. The third house being very much communication based and the ninth house being very much broadcasting based. So if you've got any planets in your ninth house, you are more probably quite likely to be working in some way um, in, in a way of broadcasting information. And that can be through teaching or it could be through publishing, for example. Um, it could be in some way social media. I kind of connect social media to more of an Aquarian type of thing, but it depends what kind of social media you're working in. You could be working for BBC News Online or um, The Mail Online or, you know, like newspaper outlets that have got an, uh, an online platform. So um, there is that. And also, you know, there's another type of spreading knowledge, which is the kind of knowledge that connects to kind of spiritual religious ideals. Um, definitely the ninth house, there is a, a sense of searching for meaning in some way. Now, remember that Sagittarius is connected to the ninth house and also Jupiter rules Sagittarius. So there is that, um, that spiritual searching and yearning for meaning connection with Jupiter. Um, so a lot of the times we can think about perhaps churches or uh, religious organisations and preachers um, and that kind of thing. So, And it doesn't have to be specific organised religions. It can be any kind of spirituality or any kind of teaching that you want to do. Um, just as an example, um, I have a friend who's a Gemini. Um, we've talked about her on the show before. I think we've talked about her in the mutable signs and in, um, oh gosh, air signs and probably Gemini as well. Um, her, her chart, it's Karis, by the way, and I'll put her chart on the blog post when I publish it. But Karis is a Gemini and she has um, a few, quite a few planets in Gemini. Um, and she has one planet in Sagittarius, which is Uranus which is opposite all of her Gemini stuff. But what's really interesting is that she's got Uranus and Sagittarius in her third house, and she's got all of her Gemini stuff mostly in the ninth house. So she's got a real Gemini-Sagittarius third house, ninth house opposition in the chart. Um, and Karis is um, a teacher, a sound therapy teacher. And since I've known her, she's always been somebody who travels. She lived abroad for a period of time she um, met somebody abroad and had a family with them and her whole ha her for the past I don't even know how many years her life has been about immigration and um, while she was living abroad with her husband um, they she was working as a teacher um, English is a second language teacher um, but she also works as a yoga teacher um, so she's she does teaching and um, she's you know uh, very active um, on Instagram and always sort of like broadcasting little messages and communicating her kind of message with people. So there's a real need for, especially with somebody who's a Gemini, there is a real need to communicate and share 
information um, and make connections and network with people as well. So she runs things like moon circles and and all those kind of things. So you know, it's it's a nice little um, kind of look at the third house and the ninth house, sort of working in a seesaw, because you know her life is about being involved in the local community in some way. And she did also for a while um, teach at a school when she was living in Brazil. She hasn't just exclusively lived or traveled in Brazil. She's, she's moved all over the place, but um, I mean, she's, she's traveled all over the place, like to India, she did yoga training and um, all sorts of things. But um, it's when she settled down in Brazil for a while, she was teaching, she worked in a school, which a school is a very third house area um, because they're both concerned, the ninth and the third are both concerned with um, education. However, the third house is much more about our kind of our general education, where we're taught all sorts of things, which is our equipment that we use in order to decide whether or not we which area we, we would like to specialise in. So what, up until you're in senior or high school, whatever you call it, um, you know, you kind of have to learn a fixed curriculum. And then once you've got to that point where, you know, you know where you want to go. So if you're going to study at, at college and you know you want to do a levels in whichever area i think they've changed all the grading system now which is just completely confusing for me but um once you've decided which a levels you want to do because you've chosen a route that you want to go down in order to study a degree for example that's where it kind of switches up into the ninth house because this is the point where it goes from instead of learning because it's enforced upon you and it's kind of education is essentially just something that you kind of have to do as part of growing up and as part of socialising and as part of networking and communicating and building social bonds and things like that, it moves into specialising into your particular area. Say you wanted to study psychotherapy, for example. I had a client who's a psychotherapist the other day came to see me and um, she's just about to qualify and she's been studying towards this qualification for probably about, I think she said about 11 years, which it's just enormous to try and comprehend to study that for that amount of time in your life. Um, but, you know, you'd pick your subjects that you knew were going to, um, you know, basically set you up to, in order to go to university. And then you'd go down that route of um, choosing your uni subjects. And this would be more an area of doing the higher education for yourself. Usually higher education, which falls into the ninth house area, is about developing yourself and broadening your horizons so when we step into the ninth house we are actually stepping into an area which literally enriches us in some way the ninth house is um trying if you're using an equal house system which is what i tend to use um i was raised on equal um but you know there, there's no right or wrong house system it's just what i use i find it for me um quite um i don't know i just i just I just find it the best one for me personally, just when I'm doing chart analysis for natal charts. Um, but yes, the ninth house is trine the ascendant and it's also trine the fifth house. So we have, um, say you've got Aries rising, you'll have Sagittarius in the ninth and you'll have Leo in the fifth, which is kind of their natural homes. But you've got that sense of yourself in the, in the first house, your perspective, your kind of outlook. Um, how you meet the world and then from the first house you have the fifth house which is where you really sort of develop your own sense of individuality and um, kind of you know learn to embrace what makes you happy truly happy you know your hobbies your passions things that you do because it's it, it's a sense of joy that it brings to you and then you've got this ninth house completing a big um, harmonious trine um, so each of these houses are 120 degrees apart and that ninth house is again another area of life where it's in it's in harmony with who you are um, and once you start delving into that ninth house you can really um, level up you can really take yourself to new heights um, and is it any surprise that Sagittarius is connected to that and Sagittarius is about um, you know enlargement and buoyancy and a sense of upliftment and you know it can be through spiritual practice it can be through travel um, you know overseas travel long distance travel where you are experiencing different ways of life different cultures usually in the ninth house area travel is very much um, insinuated 
and it's very much about um you know like for my I've, I've recorded i've recorded a show which is going out um later on down the line about astro cartography um which is about um your astrological mapping um where you look at your chart and you can look at different parts of the world where you can see um you know you could have certain experiences relating to certain planets in your own specific natal chart and when you go to those places your chart relocates i've done a whole um i've done a show on that um, but, you know, it changes your ascendant and your midheaven. Um, but you can put things, you know, you can put certain, you can you can travel to places where you, you can bring out certain experiences in yourself intentionally if you want to do that kind of thing. I haven't, um, but personally, I've traveled to places and then checked my relocated chart. And you do have experiences that really shape you, define you. Um, and my, I had an experience in India, uh, a few, quite a few experiences in India when I went to do a talk at the um, IVC conference and um you know it's the difference in life the difference in the way things are done in different countries the food um the beliefs uh the the rituals the customs all of that kind of thing are you know uh, it's all a learning experience it's all a learning experience and you come away with a sense of a different type of education so um you know travel different cultures that's also included as well as higher education as far as university is concerned or if you're not somebody who did uni I didn't um, but if I mean I studied I did study a few courses with the open university but I didn't actually go to a brick and mortar university I would have loved to have done that I think I could have enjoyed it but I'm a very specific person with a very specific um, areas of interest and I would have found it really hard to study something that just felt irrelevant to me um, so yeah, basically, if you are somebody who hasn't been to uni, but has decided to return to study a course of higher education of any kind, whether it's, you know, f as a hobby or whether it's something that you want to do to develop yourself and, you know, change the course of your life, then, you know, that's a very ninth house thing. Um, and universities are, and, you know, higher education institutions are totally covered by the ninth house. So um, just somebody else that springs to mind is my sister who was working for quite a long time in uh, human resources and operational development um, for a local council. My sister has a Sagittarius moon that happens to be in the ninth house, by the way. And um, she, when she had a Saturn transit, I think she was having Saturn to her moon. She's moon Uranus in Sag, by the way, as well. So she was having Saturn transit to her moon and Uranus. And among all the challenging things that were going on, I mean, she also had her Saturn return as well. This was this was a period of three years where she decided to go back to, she actually it was four years, she went to uni and she did one year, which was kind of like getting her skills up to like A-level standard or to university standard. And then the next three years was the actual degree course. It was incredibly challenging. It was really hard. She did it while she was working full time. She did it in the evenings. And um, it was a, uh, it, you know, it, once she finished that degree course and she did really well with it as well she really put all of her everything into it she put her all into it um you know she just her earning potential um just was completely magnified she was able to apply for jobs that were, were paying higher um, she went into a whole different area she went into like medical research um and uh, you know all sorts of things so she really has um enriched her life and her earning potential through you know three four years of like intense study which was basically the Saturn transit which anybody who's had a Saturn transit or if anyone's listened to the Saturn episode that I recorded you'll understand how hard life can get when you're having those kind of transits um, but you know Saturn leaves us with very tangible rewards afterwards it might feel like you're going through hell at the time it might feel like you know, there's no time for fun and you just, you really want to quit. He really tests you. But, um, you know, when you come out the other side of it, you feel um, like you've kind of, well, you, you've, you've, you've kind of graduated. Um, so, you know, it, the ninth house is a very, um, it's a great area of life. If you've got any planets in the ninth house, you're going to be drawn to these kinds of things. It could be that you have always been interested in different cultures and travel, whether or not you've actually embarked on that journey as part of your life yet, um, you may not have done. Um, there's definitely the potential for you to really learn a lot about 
um, you know, yourself through um, those kind of experiences, finding yourself maybe. Um, and, but with the with the third house, because I'm really hanging around the ninth house here. Um, but with the third house, you know, the third house is where we really start to make connections for the first time. It's when we go, we, we kind of go out into the world on our own as children um, and do a lot of growing up. So we have this sense of, um, you know, being in the playground, socialising with other children, making friends, making connections. The third house also kind of is connected to our siblings as well and also our cousins. So we have a sense of, um, you know, the real social aspect of being a human and um, learning about sharing and learning about other people's interests. So you can feel that Gemini essence where there's this kind of um, interaction with other people and learning about something that is completely outside of yourself. Um, and realising that you've got your own ideas and perspectives, but that person thinks completely differently to you. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you don't have to be friends. You can still be friends with somebody who has a different idea about life and what they think. So the third house is, again, it's a kind of development area, but it's not in the same magnitude as the ninth house. The third house broadens your immediate horizons it kind of makes you, <clears throat> it's kind of an area where you become more known, um, but on a on a smaller scale, you know, like whereas you've got that ninth house broadcasting element, which can be like publishing or, um, you know, broadcasting, maybe radio stations, things like that. Um, there is a sense with the third house where you become, it's almost like being being a big fish in a small pond kind of thing. You know, you go to school and you are known to your usually your, your class and then your year group. Um, and you kind of move through that kind of system together. Um, and if you're somebody who's particularly sociable and, um, you know, it has a has an ability to kind of communicate with people from all different ages, you might be known to the years above and below. Or maybe it's because you've got siblings in the years above and below. So there's an, another sibling connection. Um, but, you know, when you're at school, you're learning to write, you're learning to um, craft your your own voice and, um, you know, share that through. Unfortunately, in the, the school system I was part of, it was a very um, a specific kind of voice they want you to have. You know, academia is very, uh, the book, The, the Science Delusion, um, which is uh, by Rupert Sheldrake. Um, he talks about the voice that scientists use in order to be completely removed from the experiment, which is obviously, I guess, you know, quite necessary if you're trying to be completely um, objective. However, um, it's it's a very, um, it lacks humanity almost. Um, so, you know, the third house can be where we perhaps develop our academic voice and um, understand how to adapt our communication styles for different environments however it is also the area of life where we develop our own voice um, and actually you know as somebody who is a Gemini ascendant I'm somebody who's always kept diaries it's something I've always done I've always kind of journaled I've not never even knew why I was doing it really as I've got older it's become an obsession for me and I like to um, obsessively keep notes of what's going on in my life because I know that when I'm looking back over my transits, I can go back and go, oh, yes, that was happening. This was happening. So as since I've become an astrologer, it's become a much bigger deal to me. And one of the things that was really interesting, just to digress for a moment, was that during my Neptune transit to my stellium in Aquarius, so from about the years of, I think, two... 1999 2000 moving right up until about 2005 I think I didn't have any diaries that I kept I had the occasional entry but most of my um, writing kind of stopped and I have uh, I had Neptune move over my Mercury which is my chart ruler being a Gemini ascendant um, so Mercury moved over my chart ruler and I think it was about I think it was 2000 that that happened, that it was in conjunction and it would have, because Neptune's such a slow moving planet, kind of moving backwards and forwards. And it was the whole time Neptune's there, it's like a fog that enters your life. And for that period of my life, I just did not keep diaries. My whole life was felt very chaotic. Um, I look back on that now and I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, what a, what, 
what on earth <laughs> what on earth was going on with me um but you know as an astrologer looking back i'm like well even that is interesting because i didn't keep diaries during that time but i was having a neptune transit so that kind of describes the essence of how neptune can completely dilute any kind of ability to communicate in your normal way when it's on top of the planet of communication in your chart um but then that might speak to some of you who have Neptune in the third house. You may not be somebody who wants to put pen to paper. It may be more of a um, poetic expression, or it could be more of an artistic expression in order to communicate. Or it could be that the people that you talk to are actually, um, you know, artists and um, musicians maybe, and that your local community is um, very much built on a network of, um, you know, bands and um, music venues my ex-boyfriend for example the musician he had Gemini moon in Gemini in the 10th house so he had this expressive communicative um, uh, kind of uh, networking moon in the 10th house of profession and opposite that he had Neptune in Sagittarius um, and that was kind of his fourth house and his his he was a musician and he literally he was very well known in the local area um he would be um constantly networking constantly putting on music nights um you know he knew everybody that was involved in the music scene all the local bands worked in a music studio lived above the music studio so this kind of like um his life his personal and um, his professional life were completely there was no divide there were no boundaries which you'd expect with a moon neptune um, contact and with that Gemini Sagittarius it, it was about spreading a message networking communicating with people um, and he did have other stuff in the chart but just to focus on that Gemini Sagittarius opposition um, and you know he's he was he was talking about and I think he did start setting up his own um, music school as well to teach people how to play guitar and things like that um, but, you know, it, this is how we can really start to see depth in the chart. For me, when I'm looking at a natal chart, if we don't have the correct birth time, that's always really difficult because you just don't know if the planets are going to be in the right place. And if you have no idea what the birth time is um, and no house divisions, like if you go on astro.com, there are certain parts of astro.com where um, somebody's got an X rating for their natal chart. So there's literally no or double X. So there's literally no, um, you can't see that they've got even any house divisions. And for me, that's almost like kind of trying to explain to people. It's kind of trying to read a book, but there's no, I don't know if like if there's pages missing or, you know, it just, it just feels like it's so hard to read. You can still say, oh, well, they've got Mercury in Capricorn and, um, you know, they've got Sun in Aries and... You can pick out that stuff, but without the houses, you can't really place it. You can't really say, well, it's going to happen here or there. It's a very, um, it's, it's, it's like having only part of the information. It's like trying to organise an event and you've lost the room plan. So you don't know who's going to be in which room or what's going to go on. Um, and you kind of, you, you have to wing it. So the birth time's kind of important, but you can work around that. You don't always need the birth time, especially if, you've studied a bit more horary in election, electional astrology where you can actually select um, a chart for the moment when you're speaking to somebody and you can kind of read the moment instead of the natal chart. However, we're not doing that today and I did digress there a bit. So let's get back to the third and ninth house. So like I said, um, communication and broadcasting is um, connected. Travel short and long distance, so local versus global. Um, so Gemini being quite local. So, you know, things that are local to your local area, for example. So you might be involved in um, the local politics in um, in uh, this kind of setting, in a third house setting. You've got your local school that you went to. Um, you know, it's there's a sense of really being familiar or wanting to familiarise yourself with the place that you live and you know if you say for example you have got something quite um you know maybe you've got like your sun and saturn in the third house you're probably going to be somebody who does want to be involved in a more um serious way in the local area and perhaps in the development or the preservation of it so getting involved in local fundraisers to 
um, you know, protect the protect the natural spring that they're going to just build on top of or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there can be local involvement in um, events or uh, that kind of thing. Um, but you can be quite well known to sort of the, the, the local area. Um, and, you know, like I was saying with my with my um, ex, he kind of we couldn't step outside the front door without somebody saying, hi, how are you? Um, everybody, everybody knew him. And um, he didn't mind because he had a he has a, a, a Leo ascendant, uh, Gemini moon, incredibly sociable, incredibly outgoing. But he had this Pisces sun. So there was this need for him to kind of retreat sometimes. But he was much more of an outgoing person. Um, whereas I am, I guess I have my outgoing Gemini ascendant, but I've got this Capricorn sun and Scorpio moon, which just needs the privacy. Um, so I've always found that quite difficult. <laughs> it's It's quite a don't know I like to be in my cave and kind of come out when I choose to and I have to kind of be mentally prepare myself to go out into the world um so uh other things with um the third and ninth house like I said we've got teaching and learning like I mentioned and then there's questioning and justice yes so um the ninth house is very connected to um justice actually Jupiter is a justice planet um and you can have a sense of there is politics insinuated with the ninth house. You can have, uh, you know, political opinions. It's where we kind of educate ourselves in a specific area, become, uh, you know, quite um, well versed in things and can go out and speak with a sense of authority about something. So actually, politics can be um, part of that, um, having an opinion, the courtroom and there are other things that are kind of um, associated with law. For example, Venus is kind of a law planet. So is Saturn. There are rules um, and there's, um, you know, the need for equality or fairness. Um, but with Jupiter, there's a Jupiter being the greater benefic and that ninth house flavor of um, enrichment. Um, there is also a sense of... Um, it, wanting that justice wanting that fairness wanting that what is right and um you know whether or not we like po politicians or not um you know they they get into that kind of work usually because they do want to make a difference in the world that's a you know a positive change in some way um somewhere down the line corruption can occur but that is not necessarily um it's, it, it doesn't mean that they were corrupt when they came in in the first place and it doesn't mean that you know that they're not coming from a good place um it's just that perhaps they are um you know it's it just it, it's where people take a different stance from you sometimes not everybody believes in the same god not everybody wants to study the same subject at uni not everybody wants to travel to the same countries and not everybody has the same political ideals um, and, you know, you've got the uh, the kind of uh, the justice figures, the people who are, um, you know, sitting in a courtroom and, uh, you know, like maybe the judges, the magistrates and that kind of thing may, may also be connected to that, that ninth house sense of, um, you know, learning, um, leading by example, setting precedents. Um, there is a sense of that as well about the the ninth house. And obviously the third house is about questioning because without questioning we don't have learning um i'm trying to think if it was robert anton wilson or something who said that belief is the death of is it like the belief is the death of intelligence i can't really remember now what the exact quote was but saying that once you completely believe in something once you've committed to a completely specific outlook there's almost no room for you to be able to look at an alternative because you will more likely dismiss it rather than explore it and to challenge your own beliefs and robert anton wilson is a really interesting figure who was really um, instrumental in the um, psychedelic movement with tim leary and all of the um the lsd trials in harvard back in the i think it was in the 60s or yeah it must have been the 60s i think um but yes he's he's no longer with us robert anton wilson but he wrote a number of books um a really intelligent guy um, one of the books he's written is prometheus rising where he says everybody has a reality tunnel and everybody has a way of seeing the world and you're better off sleeping with somebody's wife you're better off sleeping with a man's wife than messing with his reality so if somebody believes that the world is a specific way 
and you know this is how it is if you challenge their ideas around their reality it can really it can really disconcert someone it can really um it, it's it's threatening to how they feel comfortable in the world and um you know i think that once you believe in a specific thing once you've committed to believing um you do not leave the door open for further growth and i think that ultimately the third and the ninth houses the third and the ninth houses and the sixth and the twelfth are um quite challenging to um express because they're much more um, i think probably the third and the ninth might be the hardest to kind of express and to learn how to communicate when you're developing your vocabulary as an astrologer because they are um i think they're in a strange way they're quite vague i think the 12th house is hard to grasp if you have 12th house stuff and any planets in the 12th house that's also incredibly hard to grasp but the mutable houses tend to be quite difficult to communicate they do tend to be much more difficult to verbalize I know whenever I was writing horoscopes, if I ever, whichever sign had something going on in the third house, I'd be like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say about this one? Because uh, it's there's it's just challenging. It's just a challenging one. Um, and there's, you know, I think that the best thing you can do when you're learning astrology um, and learning to kind of articulate yourself is to pick the stuff you find the hardest and really study it. Um, because on your way, you're going to learn how to talk about the, the easier stuff because it just comes naturally but the more challenging stuff um, the things that you find you have a blockage in are the areas where you will really push yourself to to go deeper and um yeah i do i think that the third and the ninth houses are actually really challenging to try and articulate um probably the ninth house more than anything because there's only so many times you can say broaden your horizons in a horoscope um you know and there's only so many times somebody can go on holiday once in a year <laughs> so putting you know oh you might go on holiday this month or you know, um, if you've been thinking about studying a course of higher education, this is a good time to get involved. And, you know, this is why sun sign astrology, as great as it is, because it's kind of what I call the gateway drug of astrology. Um, it's actually quite challenging because you're very limited to what you can write, especially when I wrote for L. It was like 52 words and um, per sign. And you had to say something meaningful that actually would resonate with people, broadly resonate. Um so yeah, I guess that was my ninth house moment was um, you know, refining my writing skills through writing for a major publication like Elle magazine. That was a very, very third ninth, and I spent a lot of time um crafting those horoscopes. Believe it or not, writing fifty-two words per sign is much harder than writing two hundred and fifty. Um yeah, it just is. You can say so much more in two hundred and fifty words and you can actually craft a whole story. But with a 52 word segment for each sign, you are really limited to what you can say and you have to make it punchy and it has to hit home. It's hard. Um, it's really hard. So. Um, so, yes, anyway, I, I, you know, I go off my little waffles, as you know. Um, Mercury and Jupiter are the planets which are associated with the um, third and ninth houses. Mercury with the third, Jupiter with the ninth. And they are, um, you know, I've described them before as Thor and Loki. So Jupiter being Thor in Norse mythology and Loki being um, Thor's um, adopted brother, who is one of the, the ice giants. He's actually an ice giant who Odin decides to adopt because he finds him abandoned. Um, and the ice giants are the enemies of the Asgardians. And um, if you don't know anything about Norse mythology, it's fine. Um, you don't have to. However, I would say um, watching the films um, Thor, particularly like Ragnarok, although maybe you should watch all of them just because you get a feel for the characters. Um, you know, Mercury is the trickster and um, is played by Tom Hiddleston. Loki is played by Tom Hiddleston. And then you've got uh, Thor, who's played by Chris Hemsworth. And they're silly, they're humorous, and they are not particularly serious. However, if you think about the interplay between Jupiter and Mercury, um, there is both of them are, are not too serious. Both of those planets are not too serious. Both of them are a little bit, um, you know, they, they like to have fun. Thor likes to drink and overindulge. 
Um, Loki is um, just loves to play tricks on people and can be quite mean, and people don't trust him always. Um, and you know, there there is a sense of um, they trick each other because Loki's very good at shape shifting and being something that he's not in order to trick people, and saying that things have happened when they haven't in order to get what he wants, um, and quite easily corruptible. Whereas Thor is a bit more pure of character. However, um, they both have their um, I would say Achilles heel, the things that, that seduce them and kind of, uh, you know, can persuade them to take on a bit of a, a darker side. And uh, Zeus, also um, Jupiter related, he is a, um, a nymph chaser. He's, he had multiple affairs um, in uh, uh, Greek mythology uh, and his wife was just so full of hatred for every uh, child that was conceived through these affairs um, and one of them was um, one of them was Mercury what's it what was he called in the mythology I can't think now Hermes was it Hermes um, conceived through an affair between Thor and uh, one of the nym nymphs I can't remember who but there's a there's there can be an honesty and dishonesty about I guess all of the planets but particularly with Mercury and Jupiter um, there is an element of potentially um, con or um, dishonesty or bending the truth in some way, which is another reason why kind of Jupiter can be connected to politics, as can the ninth house. You know, it's it. There is a quest for the truth in the ninth house, but it doesn't have to be the the, the highest, most ultimate truth. It could be what is the truth that resonates with the soul, um, the individual. Um, rather than this kind of collective sense of truth um, that we can't deny, um, which is a much more, I would say, 12th house ideal. Um, so the other thing, the other thing to take into consideration with the third and ninth house is that we have the uh, air versus fire polarity as well. So any of the stuff that I'm discussing, if I'm talking about planets or signs and you haven't listened to those episodes, I would strongly recommend you go back and listen to them, particularly the elements and the modes. Um, these the, the ninth and the third houses are mutable houses, so I would say listen to mutable signs. They're all about change, they're all about adaptability, um, and it's, it's, it's so, like I said, there's so many layers, it's so multifaceted. Um, there are so many different ways of looking at the signs, the planets and the houses um, that if you just listen to this, the, the podcast episodes that I've recorded and kind of apply them as you're looking at natal charts of your friends and families and things like that, you're definitely going to get a sense of what they actually, um, you know, it, it, you'll, you'll be able to go deeper in the chart. You definitely will. Now, we've done the first, second and third houses and the seventh, eighth and ninth. There's obviously so much more that I could say. This is just a, a podcast. <laughs> this is just a short podcast. You know, you could you could, there could be you could do so much study on just one specific area of astrology and go as deep as you like. Um, but the other thing about these the one, two, and three is that you've got um, different different types of houses, different types of essence of houses. You've got angular, which are the houses that line up with the angles. So you've got um, the first, the fourth the seventh and the tenth houses, which are angular, which line up with the um, ascendant, descendant, uh, midheaven and IC. And then you've got the next house along. So you've got the second, the fifth, the eighth and the eleventh, which are um, succeedant. Um, angular are more about, has, has a cardinal essence about it. Um, not surprisingly that all the cardinal signs line up with the angles. And like I said, if you're not sure what I'm talking about when I say cardinal signs, check out the, uh, the episodes on the modes. Um, and then you've got the succeeding houses, which kind of um, have a much more grounded essence about them um, and a much more um, long term and um, tangible feel because they are able to commit and to build in some way. So you've got the um, second, the fifth, the eighth and the eleventh. And then you've got succeeding, um, angular, no, cadent houses, which is the third, the sixth, the ninth and the twelfth. And these are all about movement and um transition and uh again these they, they all have a different feel to them these houses so there's different there's multifaceted ways maybe i'll do a little show on the angular succeeding and cadent houses as well but just so you're aware the um the essence for each of these so angular is much more um, cardinal 
um, succeeding is much more fixed and Caden is much more uh, mutable. Um, it just, the depth of the subject, it's like a bottomless pit. And for somebody like myself with an eighth house son, you just can't help but want to keep digging deeper. So I'll leave it there for the third house and the ninth house. I haven't really picked out a celebrity chart um, just because I haven't. I didn't think about picking out any celebrity charts as far as um, the seesaw is concerned. Though it might be interesting for you to have a look at any celebrity you can think of who has um, perhaps done well in a country that they weren't born in. Um, maybe thinking about um, English people who've done well abroad, um, you know, people who've managed to break the US market as we talk about. Or maybe you've got somebody like, maybe like Kylie Minogue, um, who has done well um, from Australia and come over to the UK and into the US and done quite well. Um, so let's just brainstorm and just think of a few people who that we can think of. And I'm just going to look up a couple of charts very quickly. Okay, so I've just had a little look at some different charts. So Kylie Minogue, just somebody I plucked out of thin air. She happens to be a Gemini. She's got a Gemini stellium. So she's got Sun, Venus, Mars and Moon and Mercury all in Gemini. However, they sit, um, they sit in her 11th house. But she does have in her ninth house Saturn and her North Node and Chiron. Um, so she does have a ninth house presence and wherever we find Saturn and Chiron usually might be an area where we feel a little bit um, like we're not good enough. But if we face our fears and just deal with it, we can actually push ourselves to achieve great things. So, um, you know, um, she's known internationally and as a Gemini, she's uh, that petite, cute Gemini who, um, you know, she's she's very young looking. Um, I know she had a lot of Botox and that for a while, but actually she's um, she's uh, she's embraced the non Botox thing now, which is quite uh, quite uh, I think quite brave, Kylie. Um, but yeah, so she's got one, two, three, four, five planets in Gemini. She would have been a good one for the Gemini show, wouldn't she? So we've got Kylie um, and uh, somebody. So I picked up loads of celebrities. I was looking at um, uh, people like. Uh, J.K. Rowling, which I think J.K. Rowling, um, author of Harry Potter, I believe she has um, Mars in Libra in the 10th house, uh, sorry, the 9th house. So there's somebody who does a lot of writing, a well-loved author with Mars in Libra there. And she's got a Gemini stellium, actually. Uh, sorry, a, a, a Virgo stellium. So she's um, she's got five planets in Virgo, interestingly. Um, someone else I thought I'd just look up was Bob Dylan. Now he's got Mars in Pisces in the third house um so here we go another person who's a communicator and writer and he is a gemini as well so somebody who has a message that he wants to share and like i've said in previous shows if you haven't if you're not a fan of bob dylan that's fine but you have to give credit where credit's due he was an incredible social comment he, a social commentator basically and um people just really got what he was trying to say and with that third house mars in pisces which is about communicating in a much more dreamy it kind of paints a picture with the communication um and with the uh, you know that gemini flavor the gemini sun um venus and mercury you know it's uh it's somebody who has to to comment um to, to paint a picture for people with words as well so he was a very good uh, extremely talented um poet really and musician and um, the one thing about Bob Dylan that I do know is that he had about $10 in his pocket back in the day and he just jumped on a train somewhere or I think bunked onto a train, took himself down to, um, I think he went to New Orleans or something and he just started finding all the um, all the places where he could go and play the blues and go and play his thing and he was a very big fan of um, somebody called Woody Guthrie and he got into the folk scene and he, um, you know, he mingled and he got to know other musicians and you know he did he did it in the old school networking way obviously doesn't things are different nowadays and we've got social media and things like soundcloud and that kind of thing um but for um for bob dylan you know he did it the old school way and went out there and did it working in the bars and the clubs and everything and uh, you know making himself well known in that respect there are so many other people I was looking at. Um, I mentioned Rupert Sheldrake, who wrote The Science Delusion. He's got Mars and Pluto and Chiron in his ninth house. Interestingly, the message he broadcasts is um, considered to be pseudoscientific. Therefore, his credibility is not particularly, um, 
you know, he's not really um, held with high regard in um, scientific circles, which is a shame because he studied, I think, at Cambridge University with Francis Crick, who was a friend of his. And, um, you know, it's, it's a shame because somebody who has a Capricorn moon who really would love to have the respect, um, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't get the respect that he, you know, he's worked very hard throughout his career. And he's also got one, two, three, four planets in Gemini as well. So this is a writer somebody who's who's a writer who's got mars and pluto in his ninth house of broadcasting and publishing and his publications are uh, kind of uh, attacking richard dawkins idea that there is no god and talking about something called the morphic resonance field which is a very out there modern kind of idea about um connecting with that sense of sixth sense really very interesting if you've not read the science delusion definitely um check it out i'm just making a note so i can put a link to you guys if you wanted to have a look at it um now who was the one that i decided to settle on actually oh, i'll tell you who i settled on gordon ramsay sorry everyone who hates him but gordon ramsay has saturn and chiron in his ninth house in pisces and he also has moon uranus pluto and mars in virgo in his third house so Gordon Ramsay has a ninth and third house opposition um, and he also has um, uh, ascendant in Gemini as well so he's naturally got that Gemini flavor about him um, and he's got that mercurial essence because he has so much stuff going on in uh, Virgo but he does a lot of I mean he's very very successful internationally and what he does is he goes to restaurants and he teaches people how to do it properly um, and he does it in a very scary way, in, in, in a way that somebody who has got Mars and Pluto in their chart, <laughs> Mars, Pluto, Uranus and Moon all kind of really bunched up together is going to be quite a um, scary and explosive combination. Um, and you know what? He's, he's a master of what he's been doing, that, that Saturn sitting up there very close to the 10th house cusp, but still in the 9th house. Um, you know, he is seen as somebody who is a professional. He's got his Michelin stars. He's absolutely um, qualified to, to go around teaching people. I mean, he even studied um, in the French cuisine, French schools of um, cooking, where they're, it's very connected, like military standards as well. So, um, you know, he's, he's definitely taken a, uh, a respectable route into becoming an authority in what he does. Um, and, you know, being a celebrity chef and uh, going and teaching people how to do things properly, broadcasting um, his, his personal message, his personal art his craft because you know let's not forget he's got sun venus and uh, sun venus and neptune in the fifth house so for him his passion um of doing what he does you know it, it, life has to be about there's an element of fun and entertainment about what he does that he has to bring in even though it's incredibly serious as well so he's a very passionate person so gordon ramsay's a good one to look at now let's have a look we've got lots of people's charts here in front of us and i've got let's have a look um oh i've got somebody here i know there's there's one person that came to see me somebody called jessica and jessica's got saturn and uranus in capricorn in her ninth and the midheaven falls in her ninth um and she also has um uh, mercury and venus and chiron in her third house and Jessica happens to be a, um, a writer um, and also um, Jessica is a client she's a she's a writer but she also is a, uh, a screenwriter she submitted her chart for this podcast so um, you know uh, she was quite happy for to, to have it shared um, and she's an absolutely lovely lovely girl um, but she is working I think she said she was working in Hollywood um, and you know coming up with storylines and um, creating um, fun ideas now the, the thought of a storyline being a screenwriter that really fits into that that third house ninth house polarity because there's a sense of coming up with stories coming up with tales um, you know uh, I suppose in a time where we have a lack of sitting around a campfire telling stories to each other the carrying the mythologies of the past forward and um the sense of that that almost like that bardic tradition of telling stories and continuing with tradition um we have television and things to do that for us now we've got things like um archetype 
um, which we um, may, may or may not be aware of playing out in certain areas of our life. But actually with archetype and with, um, with storytelling, there is actually a sense of traditional continuity. And I look at things like the Marvel, um, the Marvel Enterprise, um, the Marvel Universe and um, cinematic universe, actually, and looking at the stories that are being told through Marvel um, and seeing a lot of archetype there, um, which we are enthralled to watch and immerse ourselves in um, through this modern medium of, uh, you know, streaming and CGI and all these wonderful technologies which have really brought these new ways of t storytelling to life. But there has to be a message that resonates with us on a deep level. And I think that partly that's the essence of storytelling. It, there's making a connection with the person who's listening or the person who's reading the work or the person who's watching the work. And in order to broadcast a wider message, you have to hit certain trigger points in people and you have to create a sense of relatability, but at the same time, a sense of um, intrigue, which uh, I think... Um, and enables people to become intrigued, enthralled, connected to what you have to say. Um, you don't have to be a particularly talented writer in order to reach a wider audience. Um, I think there was a uh, the Twilight trilogy. I've not read them. I've not seen them. But people have said, you know, this this person who did this uh, wrote these Twilight films. It wasn't a particularly good one. It just kind of picked up on a on a collective. Uh, wave of interest and became a uh, I don't know like a kind of I don't know what the word is really just kind of got picked up by this collective sense of wanting to explore this area and this kind of romance even that wasn't particularly well written and I think that maybe Fifty Shades of Grey um, did a similar thing um, not the most well written book in the world it's not it's no um, it's no Lord of the Rings or you know, this kind of masterpiece type of thing, but it somehow plugged into a, a collective sense of interest and got magnified, broadcasted out there. Now, Jessica, I don't know what you're a screenwriter for. Um, I don't think we really discussed that. Um, but Jessica did say that, um, you know, she struggled with um, the fact that her ideas were, um, you know, she would come up with all the ideas and then the, t the team leader the manager would end up getting the credit and this has now suddenly made me start thinking about Mad Men again because I have been watching Mad Men lately and it makes me think about Don Draper's team of copywriters particularly the talented Miss Peggy Olsen who came up with an idea that Don used he adapted it slightly turned it in a, into a commercial which won him an award and she got very upset that she didn't get credited she got very upset that he kind of took her idea and ran with it she was offended and he said don't be ridiculous that's why you're earning money to work here you come up with ideas I pay you for it um, which is that kind of attitude um, but you could say that advertising and um, copywriting and that kind of thing is like a, um, a development of the uh, ability to communicate and to spread and gather that knowledge um, advertising definitely I would say is a, is a very ninth house thing um, Third house also, FYI, is to do with commerce as well. So you could have like local business and then you could have on the wider scale, you've got bigger business as well. So, um, you know, it's it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting polarity. And Jessica, thank you for submitting your chart for discussion. I know we didn't really go into too much depth about it, but you do have a very creative chart. You've got that Sun Jupiter in Taurus, which is very, um, uh, you know, able to commit to things. So it's very creative, uh, very fertile. It's the soil in which um, ideas can grow. Um, and you've got that third house, Mercury, Chiron and Venus. Venus being the ruler of your sun in the third house. So um, it puts a particular emphasis on the third house for you. And you are a naturally gifted writer and communicator, very articulate. And um, you've got moon in Pisces in the 12th house, which, again, like I said, the third the ninth, so the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the twelfth are all very cadent houses. They're all very mutable, and they are transitional. And uh, you know, with the twelfth house particularly, um, it, it has a sense of wanting to connect to um, humanity and uh, maybe some of the higher ideals in humanity. But actually, the twelfth house has an ability. Anything in the twelfth house doesn't really have any boundaries, and it can really reach out very far. And if you're working in 
screenwriting for television, your ideas, there is a need for you to, to, to communicate your third house message through, um, you know, through the unboundaried essence of that 12th house, which, um, uh, you know, it's, it can be a, a place where we lose a lot of energy. It can be a place where we don't necessarily have a, um, uh, something protecting us from um, leaking, <laughs> leaking our, our energy, but also uh, receiving other people's as well. So it can be a place where we definitely need to retreat sometimes, lock ourselves away from other people and to just recharge our batteries. So um, you have a very dynamic um, chart with a very, um, I would like to say it's quite a um, mutable sense about you. Um, you've got a very, uh, um, a good understanding of adaptability, a good understanding of, um, you know, though you might have, you know, a, a fixed Sun and Jupiter placement, though you've got, you know, some planets in Capricorn there, you've also got this sense and you've got a, you've got a cardinal ascendant as well you've also got this sense of movement about you as well so it's quite a nice balance um and yes you've got your lovely um mars placement there in the 11th house um in aquarius as well which gives you a, a slightly quirky edge um mars and aquarius uh, i particularly like that it's a very um i want to say charitable very giving very open-minded placement for Mars um, in Aquarius, and it happens to be in the the house of communicating with people who have a similar idea to you or from a similar network. You know, you've got the networking aspect of the third house, and then the networking aspect of the um, the eleventh house is your specific network that you've built up with people who have very um, skills complementary to your own that you can work with in order to build on a shared goal or shared ideal so um, a very sociable chart actually with that need to retreat sometimes um, and the fact I mean I, I get all sorts of very interesting people come to me for readings but the fact that you're a Hollywood screenwriter um, is particularly cool I think um, and I'm wishing you all the best and hope you, that you know um, you know you're happy and contented in your work and that uh, 2021 is being kind to you Jessica um, I guess I'm going to leave it there. Um, you know, I could have gone into other charts, but, um, you know, it's just, I can't go on forever. I could, but I shouldn't. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, thank you for listening. Um, if you are enjoying the podcast, if you are interested in hearing some of the additional insights that I have on the new moons, the full moons, eclipse seasons, lunar gestation cycles, new moon wish lists, my personal life, um, all sorts of things. My Patreon page has got quite a few posts that you can be catching up on. Um, I'm constantly posting there. And, um, you know, I have a few patrons um, at the moment. Maria, Cara, Heather and Holly. Hello, you guys. You rock. Thank you for being my patrons. Um, I am forever eternally grateful for your contribution towards what I'm doing. And I um, appreciate you guys greatly. And my BFFs um, on my Patreon page get a 15% discount when booking in with me, any of my services. And that's an unlimited discount code that can be used. And my VIPs get 25%. So I just want to say, uh, if you were thinking of having a reading with me, it might be worth checking out my, patron, my Patreon page and just checking out some of the content on there. Because you may like that. And there are other benefits in order um, to being signed up. So... Thank you very much. If you're enjoying, check that out. Also, don't forget to leave me a review, like, um, like, subscribe and rate me on iTunes if you're listening or if you're on a different platform. Um, just, you know, say hello. I, every now and again, I find a, a review somewhere and I'm like, oh, I didn't even know this platform existed. And then I find a nice little review. So I just want to say thank you to everybody who takes the trouble to do that. And next week, we're starting on the next two quadrants of the Zodiac of the house systems. We're starting on the 4th and the 10th house axis polarity, which happens to tie in with the midheaven and the IC. And, uh, you know, we're, we're already halfway through. We've already made it halfway through. So that's quite a, uh, quite a good way of doing it, I think. Uh, a, quite a, a fun way of going through the houses and looking at the polarities. Take care, you guys. Um, I appreciate all of you and I'll speak to you next week. Bye now.